Well, welcome back to a little bit of Greek. As I promised on recording 20a, after we had learned this aorist passive participle, we'd want to do a few extra things that Greek can do with participles. And here we're going to meet the genitive absolute, the idea of ellipsis, and something special to do with participial phrases. Sounds a little bit more intelligent than it actually is. Uh, remember, we always have the full class uh, in Greek available at potterschool.org or an adult version of the same at uh, American Lutheran Theological Seminary. And I always try to have lots of free resources available at Wittenberg Door Campus Ministry, Wittenberg Como for Columbia, Missouri. So what is a genitive absolute? This sounds like something that might be dangerous or hazardous to your health. In fact, it isn't. Genitive, there's a noun or a pronoun with a genitive participle. So the noun or pronoun will be in the genitive case, so will the participle, and the participle will be in the predicate position. And the word absolute is, uh, well, the word absolute takes a little explanation sometimes. It is released grammatically from the rest of the sentence. Let's look at that word, absolute. The AB stands for from or away from, a Latin word element there. And the SOLU is uh, the same as we use in the word solution or dissolve. And so it has been released away this, for that matter, is where we get the, the word that shows up in the, the Christian liturgy. The absolution is, it's not when somebody says, absolutely, you are a sinner, but it's when someone says, you are released from sin. So the genitive absolute, well, it's probably not as important as the absolution in a church service, but it is released grammatically from the rest of the sentence, and it's got a noun or a pronoun in the genitive case, and a genitive case participle. If you've ever studied Latin, by the way, this is the same as an ablative absolute, except in Latin, the ablative absolute is in the ablative case. Here in Greek, it's in the genitive case. Um, also, in Greek, it's not going to use uh, 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 an adjective. It'll use a participle, but never just a regular adjective. Well, the genitive absolute shows a state of affairs at or before the time of the rest of the sentence. So, for instance, we might use a genitive absolute to say, um, while I was walking down the street, and then we have the rest of the sentence, it began to rain. The genitive absolute would show the state of affairs at the time that it began to rain. With a present participle, it shows that this thing in the genitive case is at the same time as the main verb. So if it's a present tense main verb, it's happening right now. If it's a past tense main verb, it uh, was happening at the time of the past tense verb. With an aorist participle instead of a present participle, it's really going to refer to something before the time of the main verb. So here's one of those unusual situations where uh, a verb outside of the indicative mood in the aorist tense will actually pretty reliably show a time relationship. Uh, usually we think of outside of the indicative mood that the verb only shows aspect, whether it's a point of action or linear action, but really in the genitive absolute it does tend to show the time of the action pretty strongly. So there's the genitive absolute. They are a little bit hard to spot, a little bit hard to identify. I have a vivid recollection once of going to teach a class on a, a passage 
uh, in the Bible. It was in the book of Hebrews. I forget exactly where. And I had prepared. I thought I had prepared quite carefully and thoroughly. And we ran into something that was just uh, like running into a brick wall. And it seemed like it took about five eternities to figure out what was going on there. It was probably more like two minutes or so. Uh, all of the students were lost and I was lost too. And finally I said, oh, it's a genitive absolute, silly me. And it made perfect sense then but it can kind of be difficult to spot. You, you see the genitive case, you don't necessarily notice that, oh yeah, there's a pronoun and, and there's a participle. They might even not be completely next to each other. But eventually, once you realize that they're both there and it's a genitive absolute, things will begin making sense. Well, sometimes what that amounts to is reading between the lines a little bit, and that's what happens in our next little topic here, which is called ellipsis. And ellipsis is what happens when an author leaves out a word or words which would be easily supplied by the reader, and some people might describe it in terms that always send cold shudders of dread up and down my spine by saying, well, it's intuitive. Yes, indeed, the, the author left out something which it seemed very plain to the author that you, the reader, would recognize what was missing there and that you would supply it. Now, something we do need to remember is that what's intuitive to the author may not be as intuitive to the reader. The same as in computer programs, I don't have any idea how many times someone has said, well, of course, you, you'd right-click on that icon. Really? And how would I have decided to do that? I, I don't know. It's intuitive. So ellipsis is this intuitive use of language. Something may be left out, and you get to assume it's there. Uh, one other thing that happens fairly frequently is you may use a participial phrase as a direct object of a verb that shows perception or knowledge. Now, that doesn't seem all that unusual if we think about it a little bit. You have, so you have a verb such as I see or I saw, and then um, what, what do we have? We have something in the accusative case, and maybe we'll have a man, and we'll have a participle for teaching, and then, and those are, those are both in the accusative case, and then maybe we have a location like in the temple or on the street. Well, if, in fact, that word teaching is a participle, the emphasis there in the direct object is usually on the participle, the activity of teaching, not on the direct object that's the noun, the man. So if we have this uh, verb showing perception or knowledge, like I know, I see, I perceive, I consider, and we have a participle in the direct object, then the, the real emphasis is generally going to be on the participle, not on the noun. All right, well, is that confusing? Some of my students in the past have said, well, I guess that's just the Greek language being Greek again. Yes, I believe that's what it is. And the more familiar you become with it, the easier it will be to figure it out. Enjoy doing some Greek today, every day.